Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I, I, I'm not going to make a long introduction just so that Brent can talk, but I, we, we met each other a, a couple years ago. I was giving an a, a invited talk at Flash Forward, and actually I went back a second time, but both times the reason I accepted was just I want to learn more about the Flash community. And it turns out that actually, um, and that's where we met. And Brent is like a rock star in that world, and he's uh, he sort of goes and sort of gives the, these talks about doing these amazing things with Flash, but always sort of pushing the boundaries in terms of what you can do with it and so on. But the stuff that really, really impressed me, um, not only these books he does, so the, the, it's involved with these Masters of Flash, I think is the proper name, and, uh, yeah, yeah. but you're just like these cookbooks about how to do uh, just, he's like a talent scout and then brings it together. But how he's uh, doing, in sense, physical prototypes, like doing things like bringing in physical devices along with uh, uh, with Flash and software to, to really do really quick and, and really brilliant uh, uh, prototyping, just using, pushing the tool right to its limits. And, and I, I'm just uh, really excited to hear him, so I'd rather hear him than me. And uh, with that, uh, let's go so we have time for questions All and right. so on. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks very much, Bill. Um, it's a real honor to be here at Microsoft. I have to say, I was just talking to Manuel and uh, in saying that it's kind of weird being here because it's like, I'm just some idiot from Manchester, and next minute I'm at Microsoft's headquarters. Um, so it's kind of strange and really, really great at the same time. And, and also to be uh, introduced by uh, one of my heroes, uh, Mr. Buxton, uh, is the icing on the cake. So, um, and Bill paid me to say that as well. Um, so I wanted to talk about, um, I've entitled this Swans on the Train, which is a bit of a, a weird title, but you'll see why I've titled, that, um, titled it that in a minute. And this is really about my observations from um, what I think are quite ordinary, everyday occurrences, but when you actually uh, look at them in a bit more detail, they actually can inspire um, a lot of thinking in regards to interactive design or what I perceive interactive design to be. Um, I did a talk quite recently, and, and it was quite similar to this, and... And it went really well, but one guy came up to me at the end and he says, that's all great, but what exactly do you do? And so I thought, as a preface to this, I might as well just give you a very quick background as to who I am, and, and I won't bore you because I, I don't want this to be a Ooh, look at our portfolio or anything like that. But very quickly, um, we have a company called Magnetic North. We're in Manchester in the northwest of England. Um, Manchester is probably best known for... Uh, the Industrial Revolution and the creation of the computer, the baby, um, and also uh, the Hacienda um, Music uh, Factory Records. Um, and it's a legendary uh, music, musical city. So it's got this real history of invention and revolution, and we're very proud to be part of that. Um, and we're a team of 26 people who, and we call ourselves an interactive design company. Uh, most of our work is uh, a lot of web work for brands such as Diesel, and the BBC and Kellogg's and people like that. And uh, we're, we're a tight, very tight-knit team. Uh, it's more like a little family, almost a cult, in, in a way. Um, but in a good way, not in a Waco kind of way. Um, <laughs> so, <coughs> so, and we do uh, various, lots of different work. We do installations, a lot of web work, um, projections, things like that, and some physical stuff. So we're working with Bluetooth technology at the minute. Um, for various clients. So that's, that's a very quick synopsis of the company and, and what I do for a living. And my title is Executive Creative Director, though I'm not really sure what that's supposed to mean. But um, that's my full title. But the story for me, very quickly, is this is where it started for me, um, as probably many people in the room, a similar situation. Sinclair ZX81. This was the thing that really got me into what, the magical nature of computers, and I think it is magical. Uh, the Sinclair ZX81 was, I was given this um, by my granddad um, for Christmas one year, I think in 1981, and uh, it was 1K of RAM, 
and, and it rocks and it had no sound and and what I loved about this and I still love it, what this is why I still love it to this day is we well, plugged it in and it booted up straight away because there wasn't pretty much anything to boot um, and it just sort of sat there and, and the cursor went like this and that was it and you were like okay there was no intro, there was no flowery GUI or anything like that, there wasn't a mouse. And, it, and the reason I liked that, it was kind of provocative, because it almost seemed to say, come on then. It was like, show me what you got. And I really liked that, it sort of spoke to me, it was quite aggressive. Um, and so you had to make stuff. You read the manual, and you read a little bit of the manual just to get going. And on the same day I got this computer, I wrote my first computer program. Now the first thing anyone does with something like this, well, I, I it was definitely the first thing I did, was you write a line of code that basically puts a word on the screen and just fills the screen with the same word. I thought that was so awesome. Um, but I was, also, this was, I was also about 14 at this time, and uh, the Sinclair ZX81 was, about to, was being sold at a local uh, electronics store in my hometown. And the service in these places was always bad really bad and it still is bad to this day so I went into the store and they had some of these ZX81's set up on, this, on these screens and I just went in and, and put the word penis on the screen and it just filled the screen so I just left the shop with lots of penises on the screen and, it, and I, thought that was, I thought that was really cool, really empowering because and it was sort of like my first public installation in a way and my you know having a go against the man um, because, you know, I didn't want to actually complain to the guy in person because that's not the English way. Um, but I can put rude words on screen. So, so and this is, that's, this is what it meant to me, really, is, you know, this quote from Arthur C. Clarke. And to me, the reason we do what we do um, and the reason I love, love my job so much is this word magic. Because I think all this technology is really magical. I think sometimes we kind of lose touch with that. We get obsessed with computing power and numbers and speed and everything else and, and really for me I think it's about this last word magic now I, I'm sort of obsessed with trying to create things that are sort of almost magical and uh, how design magazine asked me to do a conference in Chicago and, and they had this big conference like 3,000 people and uh, they said, you know, we want something a bit different for your session. And I was the only sort of interactive design person actually going to speak there. So they were like hounding me for a session description. And I just looked around the room and I said, look, I'll, I'll make Play-Doh control the computer because there's a tub of Play-Doh on my shelf. And it's like, <laughs> so I go, cool, that sounds great. And I was like, yeah, it does. <laughs> I've no clue I'm going to do it. So I swear to God, um, the night before the session in the hotel, I still hadn't figured it out, and I had the Play-Doh with me, and I had an idea of how it could work, um, using some webcam technology. And, um, and this is uh, what I came up with. We've just got some sound on this. Thank you. So the idea here is that the amount of Play-Doh on screen dictates how fast the video plays. So you take the Play-Doh away, and there's less Play-Doh, the video plays at a slower speed. And now it's going really slow. And what I love about this is, it's almost like there's a, a, a kind of intimate connection between your hand and the video and the Play-Doh. You see, I put it back to normal now, and it plays normal. Conversely, double the amount of Play-Doh on screen, and the computer goes nuts can't cope. <coughs> so there you go, you take more weight. Now, now the thing was with this, I showed this at Howe and it was like the last thing I showed. And there was two reactions. One was the one I was looking for. Someone came up to me afterwards and said, I couldn't really believe what I was seeing. It was kind of like magic, uh, which was great. And then another guy came up to me and said, it's clever and all, but what's the point? And uh, to which I said, well, I don't really know. I mean, you have to sort of extrapolate things from that, you know. One, it's an experiment in just seeing how far you can push um, 
analog control of computer and digital devices, which is always interesting. But also, you know, that as a control device for children, you could set some kind of unit up that could have different colors and you could tr control video, music, whatever. And, and what I love about it, and I'll show you another project uh, later on, is the fact that you don't have to read a manual or learn anything new to control something. You're just, so from a kid's point of view, all you're doing is playing with Play-Doh and suddenly you put on this extra experiential layer. Um, and I'm really into that idea as well. So, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about a few things that, from the real world, or the analog world as I like to think of it, uh, that sort of inspire me to, um, to create the designs that we do at work. Um, and it seems to me that this word usability, as somehow some people spell it efficiency, and I don't really get that. Um, and usability can be about how quickly you get from A to B, but a lot of the time, what happens in between the A and the B is really, really important. So let's take this watch. This is my watch. And um, now if you apply um, efficient usability principles to this in a, in a very draconian way, this watch would never get made because it's 100% more inefficient than a normal watch. So in order for me to tell the time, I have to use my other hand to press the button to show the time. So therefore, it's completely inefficient compared to normal watches. Now, why would anyone make a watch like this if we're applying those sort of usability principles and, and getting from A to B as quickly as possible? Well, of course they wouldn't. Now, the reason they do is because we're, we're human beings and we don't work that way. We don't work in a logical, efficient manner. Uh, we have things called taste and um, emotion. And when I bought this watch... I bought this watch because I bought into the story and the narrative that this, this watch was conveying to me. I thought it was a lot more interesting than other watches. And that's what I bought into. And someone shouldn't be able to say, you can't make that watch because it's not usable in a traditional sense. Now, I would have loved to have shown you this website we made for BBC, Truth About Food. Truth About Food is a program that's on air in the UK at the moment. And it, it dispels the myths about food. And they came to us and they said, look, we've got all these videos online and we're going to have a page with all the videos listed, but we want something a lot more fun um, to view. And we want it also to be useful. So we built a video player. And that's, that's actually the video player, as you see it there. And this is how you select your films. And there's 40 films, each represented by 40 pieces of food. Now, I would have loved to have shown you this, but when I checked it in the hotel this morning... The BBC, in their infinite wisdom, um, won't stream broadband video outside the UK. So, it's a bit of a pain. So, if you want to get on a flight and uh, get, go to the airport and uh, check out the website, it's really worth it. Um, one thing I can show you, actually, is um, you can see the sort of how we go about making it. I wasn't going to show you this, but I'll show it anyway. So we tend to do, we, we think documentation in, in, how, in, in how you make stuff and the process of designing is really, really important for us as a company and, and as part of the creative process. So when we made the video players, we actually made them using real food. They weren't photoshopped. They were actually cut up pieces, pieces of corned beef and um, pieces of cake, etc. And that, again, gave us a much more physical connection to the work that we were doing. And it doesn't stream too well um, at the moment. But you can see that we sort of do time lapses and sort of document this stuff. So we had um, a video player that was in the shape of a piece of bread. And you can see we actually did a screenshot of the video and then put it in there and stuff. So that's how we tend to, tend to work with a lot of our stuff. And it, it gives us that kind of real-world approach. Now, experience is, is, is a big thing for me. Um, and it should be, I think, in all interactive design. And a great example of this and how we sort of learn from the things around us in the real world is I have this uh, shop in, in Southport where I live. It's, um, it's this little seaside town. 
And there's an antiquarian bookseller, real old school bookshop, magical, magical place. Um, and it's still surviving to this day. And we have the big, you know, Barnes and Noble equivalent in town uh, who sell books a lot cheaper than this other place. But I still go to this other place because of the experience that I get from going there. And you walk in and it's got three stories of books and they're piled high and they're somehow balancing and defying the laws of physics. And they've got this fireplace with this roaring fire, books and fire, don't really go together, but whatever. Um, but the really amazing, amazing thing with this store is, or shop, if I'm in, being English, um, is when you buy the book. So you, get, you, buy, you, you look around this shop, it's fantastic, and then you buy it. And then he takes it to this special machine, which is basically a roll of brown paper and some string on a wall. And he wraps your book in brown paper and string. And you're just like, suddenly this is not a book that I'm buying from a normal bookshop. Suddenly this has got a level of experience. Because when you give that, one, you feel really clever. Go walking around with a, a book with brown paper and string. You suddenly feel very academic. I don't know why, but you do. Um, but also, when you open this book, it's suddenly a much better experience than just getting a book out of a carrier bag or a paper bag and going, oh, yeah, it's a book. So when you give this someone to it as a gift, it, it's suddenly got this, this layer of experience on it that is so much more interesting and, and adds so much more. And I'll show you an example of how, how we've sort of leveraged those learnings. Now, I finished this presentation last night. And I'm always messing around with these presentations. And then I thought, well, there's actually another example I can show here. And um, you have a TV show called Deal or No Deal, yeah, in the States. Well, our version in the UK is slightly different. And it's much more low-key. You have these bevy of beautiful girls. We don't have that. Yeah. We have the general public, OK? It's much more real. Um, <laughs> So I watched it on YouTube, your version of Deal or No Deal, and I, and I thought, what, what the hell's going on here? It's like these beautiful women and this, this, this huge audience. It's, well, I love Deal or No Deal because the basic premise of it is so simple. And again, if you apply those like efficiency rules, the, the show would be over in a matter of like a minute. You just choose your number, no, yes, no, and deal or no deal, it would be over in like five minutes flat and you wouldn't have a show. And one thing TV and film people are amazing at is um, creating these levels of experience from, from nothing. And so if we just watch a, a little Take piece here. We're all with you. We want to believe that Sarah is right. Your first box is? Jasmine, 17. Thank you, Jasmine. Notice there's no beautiful women. It's just the people with the boxes. It's cheaper as well. So I'm just going to stop it there. Here's the insane thing about deal or no deal, okay? There's nothing in the box. Why is it a box? It might as well just be a sign. You know, and that he flips over. You know, is it a... Oh, 10p. Woohoo! People cl clapping for the 10p. It's like... So, and the thing is, though, the box creates a different level of experience. So, if you watch what he does as well, and it's so brilliantly done because it's so subtle, is everyone who opens these boxes, and this is why it's better than the American one, because, in my opinion, um, they all lean on the box, and, they, and also, the box does you notice the box doesn't just open, they don't just go like that. They lean on the box, and then they pull the tape transition and there's two transitions going on there which are really really important if you just went like that I go big deal and it'd still be okay but it wouldn't be as good and this is what um, people on TV and film directors are so brilliant at and I think there's so much we can learn interactive design wise from that so just just watch again and maybe I'm a bit too obsessive about deal or no deal it's not healthy but okay then it's you 
So he holds the box out and, he, and, it, and it's subtle. But I think that I leverage so much stuff from that. It's incredible. And I'm not going to make you watch the whole six minute sequence where she wins um, 250 thousand pounds. By the way, the money you win is actually lower. You have a million. We have a quarter of a million. So uh, we're not as greedy. Uh, so <laughs> Take it. So, so, so we leverage that kind. Those kind of experiences are really important to us, I think. And these transitions are really important. Um, incidentally, I, I didn't have it with me, unfortunately. Um, but if you want to know about transitions and editing, uh, there's a film called Shane, which is probably the best Western ever made, um, made in 56. Get that film, just watch it, and watch for the amazing uh, way they use editing and pausing and transitions and stuff in that film. And it's a cowboy movie, nothing to do with interactive design, but it teaches you so much. So, it was the one clip that wasn't on YouTube, unfortunately. So, um, we did a site for Diesel, um, the clothing company, and uh, it was basically a new handbag they were launching. It was a, a haute couture handbag. They were moving into a new market, um, and it was a very expensive, like, 500 euro bag. Um, so it's, it's fairly expensive for a handbag. And people become obsessive about this handbag. So when we did our research, people would go online and, and put their name down to be the first to have these the bags like this. So we leveraged that, uh, that, that whole narrative. And... Um, we decided to really play on that. So we, we created a site where if you wanted one of these bags, you could win one, and there was only one to win, but you had to tell us what you would sacrifice in order to win it. And they had to be good sacrifices. And you had to sacrifice it, supposedly. So it, was, and it got quite dark. It got kind of weird. Um, now, the competition is now closed, and um, the winner... This is my opinion, but I thought it was a bit, you know, wasn't the best, best winner, but this is what Diesel chose, and obviously they have their reasons for that, and their winner was someone who sacrificed their personal trainer. So we've got that information on the front of the site. That was obviously never there when the site was fully, fully operational, but this is all about the brown paper and string stuff and the deal or no deal stuff, um, putting these levels of experience in. And remember, this is a site for a handbag. Okay. <clears throat> so the whole idea is it's very filmic, very experiential. <clears throat> and we've got these, these are the sacrifices that people have, um, have made. And this is all obviously dynamic. Um, and you can read them. And now, one of, one of the problems we had was... Some people didn't know to click and hold. And I think it's one of the things that drives me crazy is some people either, if it doesn't work with a click, they straight away will they'll click and hold it. Some people will click forever. So we had to put in a little visual clue. And um, it's gone now. But what happens is if you continually click and don't hold, it'll start saying, like, pull me closer to you. And then the level of messages will actually get more functional. To the end it goes, click and hold you doofus, or words to that effect. So, so you go through like that. And we'll just quickly, this is like the brown paper and string thing. We're, we're peeling back these layers. So <laughs> it gets more and more weird. And the music starts to build up. The music's completely interactive in that as, as you go through the site, it starts to build and build. Touch me, senseless. Sensory filtration, sensation, elevation. Near before boring. So it reaches a crescendo and you're thinking, what the hell is going on? I thought this was a site about a handbag. Um, and you're thinking, God, something's got to be at the end of this. And so eventually you get to the shrine with the bag. And, and we thought, you know, the client was a bit like, is anyone even going to bother going that deep, you know? And the only place you could actually submit a sacrifice was actually here. And we have thousands of sacrifices. So, yes, people did make their way to the shrine. Um, 
because we sort of pulled them in and it's very experiential, hopefully. But then you've got, you know, your functional stuff so you can learn more about... You obviously want to see pictures of the of the bag. Um, and there's a huge picture loads in. Um, and we do stuff like, you see, back buttons drive me crazy. Um, and try not to have back buttons where I can help it. Um, so it was just a huge back button. You could not click anywhere else. You just like, that hand came up, you clicked it, and it disappeared, and that was it. Um, trying to remove these interface elements that sometimes we've become like the default and you just go oh, well we'll have a back button there well do you actually need one all the time and then of course you can go back and you can any of those sacrifices you actually passed you can go back and and see them again and it's all in this 3d landscape and essentially all, all that's happening here and this is a bit deal or no deal this is this is it's weird this is um this is a database. This is just a display of text in the database. That's all this is. But we've gone the red box route and made it obviously more interesting. And then you can page through the database. You don't know you're paging through a database. We don't need to go loading XML. You know, no one needs to know what XML is. No, users don't care. People, they don't care. Why should they care? So all those kind of things should always be hidden, I think. So, so that's the diesel site, and that's how we sort of leverage um, the brown paper stuff. Now, <clears throat> someday, I hopefully, we'll make an interface that's as beautiful as, as this. The, the, the humble pencil um, fascinates me. Um, I love it for many reasons. One is um, it's got a built-in progress bar. As you use it, it goes down. Um, it also tells you what, you know, that whole affordance thing and visual feedback, it tells you what end to use. Um, it's got, it's pointy. So even if an alien landed on Earth and never seen a pencil before, pretty much probably would look at that pointy end, hopefully, and, and go, well, that's, that's the bit I use. Um, and also, you know, it's got this built-in status display. You can tell how well it's going to perform before you even touch it by how sharp it is. Um, if you've got a good eyesight, obviously. Um, so that all those three things combined in a, in a thing that is actually because of how it's made, um, I, th I find really, really interesting. Now, there are other examples around the home, around every day that you can sort of use to inspire um, interfaces and interactive design thinking. Um, and one is that's used a lot is um, the, the stove or the hob, as we would call it in England. This is... This is mine. And I've used this before at, at quite a few flash conferences um, just to get over this point that there's, there's absolutely no visual feedback here going on. So we have these four rings and then you've got the controls down the side and you have no idea which control controls which ring at all. Um, and even... And, the really nice feature is the label's actually written in silver as well. So you have to like almost get an electron microscope to see what controls, controls what. So you start to think, well, you know, how is this mapped out? And I, my own thing is I think whoever designed this, his friends got cool design jobs at Audi and places like that, and he got this job designing stoves. So he's, he's a bit brassed off, or he or she. Um, and so it maps out like this, which doesn't... Yeah, and it's kind of weird, but, so I, I, I use this quite a lot of conferences and go, no, it's insane, it's insane, but it's actually clockwise, or anti-clockwise, I can't remember, and a friend pointed it out, Brent, you know, it, there is actually some logical order, it just doesn't feel that way, and we've had this for years, and we still don't know which control controls which, we're always burning ourselves and turning on the wrong thing, so... We just haven't learned from it. And it's one thing to have an interface, I think, that, you know, is maybe a bit unusual, but when you've not learned from it in four years of using the damn thing, that ain't really good uh, from a user experience. So I have a little project that I've, I've just, like, this is a little side project that I've been working on. And it's just a little thing, and I, I just wanted to show you, show you that. And 
And these, are, these kind of like little projects are great because they allow you to try ideas out uh, without anything being mission critical um, and just explore stuff. So this was a little photo widget I created. And all it does, it shows um, photos from Flickr. And what I wanted to do was just show them, rather than in a linear list as such, um, show them in a way that's probably a bit more fun. So you can, you can drag these around if you, if you so desire. You can actually look through them. So it's, it's a bit more like you know, throwing photos on a tabletop. And then you know, to view them, they just zoom in. And then you click on the background to go back. Now, this was like version 1. And uh, people can use this and bring in their own Flickr photo streams. And it, it, all they do is have to set um, an XML file. And, and it, it's cool. That's all they do. They don't need Flash or anything like that. And it just kind of works. And that will link through to the actual photo on Flickr. Now, this is the first version I did. Um, and, and I thought it was pretty obvious that you had to click on the background to get back. I was talking to a few people and watching people use it. Not everyone got that. So I thought, well, I don't really want to have a close button or an X or a back or anything like that. So just redesigned it slightly. And I think this is uh, pulling in pictures of Seattle then. Uh, so you can do like, you know, search for different tags and things like that. So all I did with this was... I moved them to the side, the ones that you didn't select, and blurred them out as well, so it got a bit of depth of field. And, and then, you know, hopefully people would go, oh, you know, click on the ones that weren't selected, and you, you go back. Now, there's a slight anomaly here, because you're clicking on a picture, where before that brought the picture up, and now it's taking you back. Um, so maybe that needs fixing. Um, but it seems to work, and it's a bit chuggy because Flash doesn't like blurring 20 things at once. Um, so you can turn that off if, if you so wish, but I've kept it on here to, to show you the sort of effects. And I think that depth of field effects adds, adds something to it as well. And, and it makes you concentrate on the photo in the foreground. Um, now, I've taken it a stage further with the latest version in that I wanted to show um, sets on Flickr. And the way I've done that is, well, these things, it's almost like stacks. So instantly, visually, straight away, you can see how many photos or there are, how many photos are in a particular photo set without any numbers uh, or anything like that. So you can see, this is uh, pictures of Cape Town. There's like, well, there's a lot of pictures in that. Now that, there's actually 70 pictures in that photo set, but... In all, if I was to put 70 movie clips in Flash on top of one another, it would just chug. So what I've done, I've just halved it or divided it by a third. I can't remember which. And what it does, though, it still gives you enough feedback to know that oh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of photos in that one and there's not a lot in that. And that one's got you know, a bit more than that one. And that, I think that's enough to sort of see how many photos are in there. Now, also... The little touches of, notice the drop shadow is actually as if the pile is actually higher and things like that. And that's the sort of things, as Bill mentioned before, prototyping in Flash is actually really, really quick because you can do all this kind of, kind of stuff. And these, I'm really into like doing all the finessing on these things that a lot of time is, is kept to the last minute. Sometimes I do those first because that's just how I am. And I like the visual look of things and it gives me a better feel for something. And Flash allows you to do that and prototype this stuff really, really quickly. And of course, that, what you can then do is obviously you can click on these things. And this isn't perfect yet. It's, it's, I'm still working on this, but... So, that's how that works. But that's sort of inspired by, um, you know, looking at how interfaces work in the, in the real world and that kind of stuff and, and cutting it back to its actual, absolute minimum. So... This title, Swans on a Train, it's not because I think Swan <laughs> Snakes on a Plane is a great movie, which it isn't really, but... Um, so I had my own incident of this random act of kindness, and, and this is about everyday mundane train journeys that 
that I get every single day uh, when I'm working into Manchester. It's about an hour and ten minute train journey. And, um, you know, nothing, generally, something never happens really. But then when you start to look at, like, the people around you, the sort of interesting things can happen. So one night I'm coming home, it's a Friday night, and um, I fall asleep. And when I tell this story, by the way, everyone says to me, that is not true. And I swear to God, it is true. So for the record, this is true. Um, so I fall asleep, and the, the carriage was packed. And then when I wake up, like, 20 minutes later, there's hardly anyone left on the carriage, because I'm on, like, the last stop. And um, I notice on the seat opposite me, there's this note. So I look at it, and... It's got a message on there, and it says, written on this receipt, it says, PTO, please turn over. Okay, so I'm now looking at this note, thinking, and I'm looking around, thinking this can't be for me, what is it? Um, some kind of weirdo left me a note. Um, but the beautiful thing is, I couldn't not pick that note up, because... There's a level of intrigue now that I'm now embroiled in. Um, just by the use of a biro and a piece of paper and three letters. So PTO. So I'm looking around and seeing if anyone's watching me going to pick up this letter you know, on the seat opposite me. And I have to pick it up. So I turn it over and it says, please take these swans spelt wrong. Which again, you can read so much into that because if you actually look at the receipt here, They've got a French dictionary and a Spanish dictionary, and um, you know it's bought in. It's actually bought in uh, Southport, I think, my hometown. So, you know, why is she on the train going to Manchester? Um, maybe she, English isn't her first language. You know, we can start to build up all these uh, backstory about this person that I've never met. So, anyway, it says, "Please take these swans," and I'm thinking, "What swans?" <laughs> This is, this is like a David Lynch film. Suddenly swans are going to come in to the carriage and I'm going to be carried away with them. I'm going to fly. And so I think, swans, what swans? And then I look. And the bit that I thought was litter <laughs> is actually origami swans that someone has made. Someone has made them. Now, I'm just like, and I, of course, I take them. And I, I was actually writing um, the book, the last book I've done, and I was still in the pros, uh, throes of writing that. And I came home to wife and I like, it's amazing things happen. What's that? She said, someone's made me origami swans. It's like, great. You know, no, don't you understand? So, <laughs> what's up with you? Um, so, we, these swans appeared. And I don't know who they're from. Um, I don't know why. I don't know if they were meant for me. But... Again, the thing I really, really loved and why I thought it was beautiful and clever is this bit. They could have easily just said, please take these swans on a piece of paper and stuck it on the thing. And that would have still been cool, but not as cool as doing this. Because what they've done is added a, an extra level of intrigue and, and suspense. This is, a, this is a lesson in suspense. As good as any Hitchcock movie, um, you know, it's there and it's on a train with a tray with a, a receipt and a piece of paper and a you know a pen and I, whoever that person is I just thank them because going around the world doing conferences about origami swans now um, so now I think it's always good and it's a cathartic experience to actually slag your own work off <laughs> occasionally uh, which we're going to do now um, and the bit, the reason we're going to do this because we've talked a lot about uh, people, or users, or I prefer the term people, generally. Um, but I think we're, the Flash world, and particularly the Flash world, was always, the problem was that we were design a lot of the time we were designing for other designers and other Flash designers and other design mags, and we were just doing cool stuff for the sake of it, and not thinking about the people who were actually going to use this stuff, and we had long, protracted intros, and etc., etc. So... And I think we should be designing not just for the mums of the world, um, but, you know, people who aren't geeks, like pretty much us, everyone in this room, and there's nothing wrong, you know, I'm a geek, nothing wrong with that. But you always have to pull it back to the real world, and, and 
obviously this is why you use a test, etc. So obviously my mum sits there all the time like that on the laptop. That I just snapped this picture by chance. Um, so I want to show you a piece of work that I worked on back in '98, and this was when the whole flash thing had just started to kick off really big. And I remember doing my first ever flash movie and coming into um, work, and I worked at a different place then. And I was just amazed at this thing. And you do full screen animation, it's amazing. Let's just get, just get it on everything. So you know, forget what the users want. Um, and so it, it, I always remember it, and it's sort of like this epiphanal moment. And so I want to show you um, the site that we made. or We made a lot of sites. And back then, we, this was a company called Subnet, and we were typical boys in a bedroom, winging it big style. Um, but had a sort of handle on this technology that no one else had a handle on. We, we'd, got to get, we'd got to know Flash. We were doing director stuff. And, you know, you couldn't go to college to learn it back then. So you just had to get to know it. And we sort of had a handle on it. And some bizarre reason, we ended up working for Disney and Coca-Cola. And, and we were just like, yeah, I mean, I was 30 at the time, so hardly a kid. But the rest of the guys were like really young, straight out of college, Client service, forget it. Dealing with clients, hadn't a clue, making it up. Project management, making it up. But we were working for like these big multinationals. So it's crazy. But, and and as an, uh, to show you how crazy it was back then, we had a sticker on the door. Um, we were in like this technology park. And it so happened there was a holiday company in the same place. And they were very famous, as you'll see, um, holiday company, a very uh, hedonistic holidays, Club 1830 holidays. And they basically do holidays to Ibiza in Spain and the Balearic Islands. And basically, young lads just go out there to get drunk and other things. Leave it to your imagination. Um, and, and it's just a party full on. And that's what they sell as a holiday. So this guy comes up to us and he, he sees the sticker on the door of our company logo and he just says, make me a website like that. That was the brief. That's how sophisticated briefs were back then, back in 98. So we went, yeah, and this was like a big deal holiday company. They weren't like local or anything. They were famous, lots of PR, because they're quite notorious for what they do. So it was great. It was a great in for us. And we made a few iterations of the site, but the one I wanted to show you is this. And I always keep this on my hard drive because it... If, you ever get, you know, if I ever get big-headed or anything, I look at this and it brings me back down. Um, so this is an abject lesson in not designing for your mum. Okay. So now let's, let's remember here that people are going to this site to book a holiday. Or to at least, you, can't, you couldn't actually book a holiday back then. Um, but they wanted to actually just see where the holiday, the where they could go to and the apartments, etc. So this is the first thing you see when you come to the site. And it's, it, it's just a congratulatory thing of how incredibly clever we are as developers and designers and everyone else is a bit thick. Um, so it says, well, it's incredible music, stunning visuals, um, blah, blah, blah. And then the first thing you see, and I don't forget, you're just coming to find out about a holiday, make sure you pack your plugins before you set off. Click here. Now, what the hell is a plugin? We're talking about 98. This is like, Flash is really new and people don't really know about plugins and nor should they. Um, and that's the first thing we tell them. And then it, it gets even better. You must have Flash to view this site. We also advise Netscape Navigator 4. Now, most people, probably even today, don't know what version of browser they've got. And, and why, why should they care, to be honest? So, and then it gets even better. This is an advanced warning. This is an <laughs> it's always good to warn people on your website. That's always a friendly thing to do. Um, Warning, this is an advanced website using the latest web technology. Because of this, Internet Explorer 3 will not work with this site due to its limited JavaScript support. Please read the technical details before proceeding any further. Oh, uh, it gets worse. So, and then we've got this gobbledygook. This site makes use of the latest web technologies because we're really clever and you're not. Um, to bring you an online multimedia extravaganza like no other. Again, we're clever. We recommend use of Netscape Navigator 4 or Navigator 3.01. 
Uh, due to an internal bug in Navigator 304, we do not advise use this version, right? So if this person is thinking, all I want to do is go on a holiday. I don't want to be a web developer. Internet Explorer 4 is also fine, but will not work with the Beatnik plugin. At this point, what the hell is the Beatnik plugin? Do I need it? Can I see anything without it? Internet Explorer version 3 will not work in capitals due to its limited support of JavaScript. So it's like, I'm exhausted even just telling you that. And this is, you know, and it gets worse. This is, not, this is not the end of the pain. So anyway, if this person, for some insane reason, wants to actually carry on and look at this site, you know, you, you go to return to the home page. Now, and it's a beautiful design, obviously. Um, <laughs> moved on a bit, hopefully, now. Um, and I love this bit at the bottom. The enter button for the site is actually smaller than our logo. <laughs> it's like, we've made this site, we're cool. Oh, by the way, if you want to have a look at the client, yeah, whatever. Um, so, so anyway, like I said, this was one of the first sites we used, uh, Flash version 3, I think it was. It might be 2. Um, and so we were like, balls out, let's show the world what Flash can do. And uh, so straight away... Can we have some sound on this, Graham? Thank you. Oh, here we go. So, big logo, flying in. We're, it's so cool. Look at us. We're clever. Club 1830. Now, I was really into circles back then. And I was the daddy of making circles go like this to this. So, we just used it on everything. So, so <laughs> as you can see, woo! So... And this navigation is a work of genius, even if I do say so myself. You don't know, there's no labels, no nothing. Um, I was also into Bryce at the time, so that's why I did like 3D spheres. <laughs> no other reason. Um, so you're going around here and you're... You're trying to make head, head and a tail of it. And we're doing, like, clever stuff. We've got, we've got windows talking to other windows. Flash talking to other Flash in other browser windows. I mean, this was, like, you know, advanced if you were a geek. But, you know, from a user perspective, horrible. So, my favourite bit is this reunions bit. This was my um, magnum, magnum opus of, of circles. So, there's the word reunions there. Watch out. Here we go. Strap yourself in. Any minute now, you're going to see circles like you've never seen. <laughs> there we go. Come on. Now, now, here's the really cool bit. Here's the clever bit. There's nothing beyond this intro at all. There is no content. It just loops around. Yeah, because the client didn't, <laughs> the client didn't have any content. Uh, all, all the content they had was just apartments, and this was going to be like a big area where when you had a reunion, like after being on holiday, they'd post pictures up and never happened. So this was just a, a big intro because we had to fill it with something. Um, and the other thing with the client was that I didn't tell you was, this is how crazy it was back then. Eventually, while we're making this site, they moved to London and we were in the northwest of England. And... Their IT department wouldn't allow Flash to go on the machines, and that still occasionally is the case now. Um, so in order for him to sign off the designs, he had to drive 300 miles to us to see the stuff. And that was the proper, and you know, information superhighway. That was the M6 in the, in the north of England. Um, but the client, and, and here's, here's the other crazy thing. This one... Uh, Website of the Year and the New Media Age Awards beating British Airways with all their functionality of buying a flight. And this won. This beat them. So, because, and, and it's a sign of the times, though. It was like, this is, people haven't seen this stuff before. It's like, look at the size of that Skegness there. It's like, no one's seen a Skegness that big, ever. So, so I keep that. And I sort of keep reminding myself of how not to do stuff, hopefully. Now, I also think, though, it's actually good to do really stupid stuff occasionally. 
just for the sake of it, because it actually teaches you about... Um, I think people sometimes are a bit too reverent with data and, and code and stuff, and I think you know, just give it a good kick in. Um, so I do things like this. So this is on my site, and you can type in, I don't know, Seattle or something. And uh, you get your results back as a series of burgers and fries <laughs> for no reason. <laughs> and it's just stupid. But what this taught me, this taught me about uh, using the SOAP protocol and, and, and thinking about, you know, we don't have to present data in a certain way. Um, and then there's another one. I was, on the, I was just on this tip for a while, so I can put in a, I'll type in the same search. So you type that in, and you get your results sideways on. Um, which is great if you've got a laptop, you have to orientate your laptop to, so you can read it. But the whole point of these things is, is to just actually be a bit irreverent with data. Um, and also, it, it, they're just exercises in, in code and programming. Um, and then other things like, why does a DVD have to be played in a DVD player? Um, because that's sort of what we're told. Well, you can do that. But we can also, obviously, if you want to watch a film, that's what you do. But you can also do other things, like I wrote this program in uh, Processing, which is a Java-based uh, environment. I'm sure many of you use it or know it. Um, and I just thought, and it, uh, these things can just be like one simple thought, and then you go, well, let's just see what happens. So if you take every frame of a movie, and instead of displaying that frame, display it one pixel wide, what happens for every frame? And what happens is you get sort of this, it's like a slit scan thing. So this is um, Don't Look Now with Donald Pleasance, which is an amazing, fantastic movie and also very eerie. Now, this, I think this is quite fascinating, but maybe I need to get out more. Um, this is, uh, you can sort of make out Donald Pleasance there and screaming when at, at the beginning of the film his daughter uh, dies in a, in a river. And you can see he's sort of, his screaming is really anguished. It's you know, the way this program has actually created these images. And also, the theme of the, the, the running theme throughout it is the color red. Throughout the film, you see this like weird guy running around in a red anorak, and it's really creepy. And weirdly, we have these little bits of red in, in, the, in the parts of the frame. I don't know why they're there. And it's almost like, you know, if I played it backwards, maybe it'd tell me to kill people or something. I don't know. But it's really strange, and it's only because I sort of took the data and then just mangled it, and, and you know, we can look at data that way or we can do something alternate with it and then look at how else we can um, interpret it. Again, you know, Batman movie, you can turn it into text. I think that says, holy cow, Batman or something. Um, and that's just all the pixels. Instead of just putting the pixels on the screen, you you render each one as a, as a piece of type. And, um, and you can watch a movie like that if you want, if you so wish. Well, the one I've had um, the most publicity from is, is this kind of thing that I called uh, Cinema Redux. And this, again, was done in Java. It's like 50 lines of code. It was like a morning's work on a, on a, on a weekend. And I just thought, what if you take a frame from a movie every second and render that frame eight by six pixels um, and then lay them out so each row becomes a minute of film time what happens and so what happens is you get blocks of massive data representations like this and this is the film hero uh, the martial arts movie and I chose that one I've, I've done quite a few of these and this is a particularly good example because hero has these um, thematic color themes going through it um, you can see them quite clearly. So you've got your red section, your blue section, your green section. And it almost becomes like a high-rise block or something. It's, it's just strange. And, you know, some people this really sort of spoke to. And I've got to be honest, if I was some kind of artist, um, I would pontificate about what I'm trying to do here with movies. Um, but I'm not. Uh, I'm just... I just tried to see what happened when I had this idea. And then people started to read into it. And it was in the Guardian newspaper, a big newspaper in the UK. 
and, and I love the fact that it was in the Guardian rather than some geeky magazine and that guy was, saw this and he, he said it creates new ways to, um, to deliberate about film I was like, does it? <laughs> cool so <laughs> I've got to be honest with you, I could pretend that that's what I was thinking when I started to do it, but I didn't. Um, but it's nice that people look into it in, in that kind of way. So, a um, couple of things that keep me awake at night. This thing I, I've sort of termed evidence of use, um, whether that's a term that exists or not, I'm not sure. But um, this was my, uh, when I was writing this book, I was looking through some old magazines and I've got the uh, original computer and video games magazine from 1981. Um, I don't really hoard that much stuff nowadays, but I do keep the odd thing, artifacts, because it's sort of important to us. Um, and what I loved about this was you could tell there was a narrative there within the pages themselves. Um, this was, again, the ZX81. Um, and when I lo was looking through this, I thought, oh, that's cool, it's an advert for ZX81. That's, you know, my first computer, etc. And then I carried on looking through it, and there, impregnated on the page, was two tea stains. And I thought, that must have been where I... And I, yeah, again, this wasn't made up for the book or anything. This is, these tea stains existed, and I thought, God, I must have just been looking at this computer wantingly wanting this computer you know, as a kid with my cup of tea in my bedroom um, no friends sad um, so <laughs> I'll show them one day um, so I had that, this cup of tea and I was obviously you know I was looking at this magazine for, for a long time so this suddenly meant something this this page this magazine this analog material suddenly had a story impregnated into it now what bothers me is that digital stuff is very hard to sort of impregnate these accidental scratches, these um, accidental narratives in, a, in, in our work because they're digital. And um, when I pick a file icon up, it doesn't know that that's been touched a million times, really. I'm, I'm not talking about modified dates here. I'm talking about it just doesn't show that it's been used. And it's like... If you've got a vinyl, you know, vinyl record and it's got a scratch on it, and it might remind you, oh, that was when Steve bumped into it at the party and it's never been the same since. But you don't throw it away. You keep it because it reminds you of something. It reminds you of a moment in time. And I'd love to see a way, um, and you're probably going to tell me that you've already made it and done it, so I'll shut up. But it um, would be great if there was a way to sort of represent these sort of accidental scratches in a digital form. And I haven't got the answer to that, but this one, again, it's one of the things I, I do think about. Um, and equally, where's all my stuff gone? Because it's like disappeared. This is like, you know, bookshelf and everything at home and stuff on it. And, and why do we keep books that we've already read, generally? Um, we might give some away or whatever, lend them to people. But we keep them because they represent us as people. They are part of our personality. We, tell, we like to show off, which is why we do blogs and stuff. Uh, people like to show off and tell people about themselves. And, and it seems to me in our homes, because a lot of our stuff is being digitized, and, and the, there's so many great things about digital stuff now, and it, you know, the storage and how you don't have to have rooms full of, full of vinyl, and obviously that's a good thing. But then, you know, suddenly people can't walk into your room and go, oh, have you got that album? Oh, I didn't know. You know, they, they see things and they spark conversations. No one can see my album collection on my computer without spark firing my computer up and looking through it, which they're not, obviously not going to do. So it doesn't, it doesn't spark these, like, moments of conversation, which kind of bothers me. And it, you know, conversely... While all my stuff is actually disappearing, I'm getting more digital gadgets. So I'm getting more of the stuff that doesn't really have an emotional connection. I'm getting more of that stuff, but less of the other stuff. And it kind of worries me. Um, and so I started to look at, uh, we as a company, we started to look at digital uh, music and how we can represent album covers. Album covers are pretty much dead now, really, because people 
by single tracks and you know you get that little thing on your iPod or, or whatever or your Zoom and you've got an album cover to, you know and it, it, what it's trying to do is obviously try and replace what the 12 inch album and really that's been dead since CDs as well and n never really the same with CDs even um, so was there a way to make something that could represent an entire track and that was unique to that track and became maybe a painting that you could print or put on your wall would spark a conversation so we looked into that and we wrote a little Java thing and and this this is what it was apologies for the music So what's happening, actually happening here is um, it's analysing the frequency content of the sound and creating a painting based on those frequencies. So the size of the circle, the colour of them, where they go on the stage is all dictated by the, the music itself. And the whole idea with this is that we don't really want to make it look digital as such. Because personally, and it's a personal taste thing, I can't stand those screensavers that are like you're in some kind of rave all the time. It's like, well, I've got Damien Rice on. Why have I got like visuals like this? It's like, I don't trippy visuals. I don't really go. So, you know, so that, those are important things. It's all about the aesthetic and trying to communicate music properly. Um, and this builds and builds and builds, and I'll, I'll forward it. I won't play the whole song, obviously. Oh, you probably kill yourself. Um, so you end up with, you know, a, something like that. Now the point is that, oops. The point is that um, it's unique to that track. You can play this track again, and you will get exactly the same painting. There is no randomness. Um, so you could feed several tracks through it and, and get these kind of interpretations. And then alter the algorithm slightly to get different kind of feels and looks, different colorways and, and all sorts of stuff. And then print it out, you know, or sell it online or whatever. Um, so we've not really done anything with that kind of idea. It's just sort of sitting there on, on hard drives. And So one final thing to show you and I have a DVD. Um, has anyone heard of Miss Pinky? Good. Are you going to like this then? Um, Miss Pinky is um, it's this vinyl. Now this is what this is why I love the the job that we all do because every single day there's like a surprise. There's like a little gift that you don't know about. And I was just searching around the web and we were asked by um, the Foundation for Arts and Creative Technologies in Liverpool to fact to come up with an idea that they could fund. Um, and so we, we were searching around for, for some stuff and we chanced on this. Miss Pinky is a, a vinyl, time-coded. And time-code vinyl has been around for a while. Final Scratch uses a similar system. Um, so if you played this on a stereo, as, as this is, on a turntable, you hear basically it sounds like a modem, old-school modem. Um, and it's basically time-code. And you can then use that time-code to control well, anything you want. Once you've got that inside your computer, you can do anything with it. So what we did was we looked at um, how we could use that. And rather than... Now, obviously, you could, I could take it, build something, and go like that. Ooh, cool. You know, with scratching. And it'd be rubbish. Because I'm not a scratch DJ. I'm not a practitioner. I'm not a professional scratch DJ. And it's important with these type of things to really put them through the paces. So... I will show you what we did. Uh, we hooked up with a DJ called G Cut, real name Gareth, um, and he's a an amazing um, turntablist, as, as they call themselves, scratch DJ, uh, based in Manchester, and he organises the World Championships, and he's, it's what he does for a living. That's his job. Um, and we hooked up with him and said, "Look, we've got this technology. We want to try it out, see what it does, and uh, would you be interested?" And he obviously said, "Yeah." And, um, and then we performed it at Fax, and they have this huge cinema screen. And so I'm going to play you a little bit of that and, uh, and show you what we did. What you 
you're going to hear about today is nothing short of a miracle. It's dramatically... Now watch, he's so cool. He only comes in at the last minute at the bottom of the screen. ...only through years of research, invention, and innovation. Living stereo played on a record. Record. Now, again, the cool thing with this is that he's not learnt anything new. He's just using the same skills that he's always known. It's, it's a turntable, vinyl, that's it. I'll just forward it on because it gets a bit more interesting. And you can see, now, you can scratch anything. We were scratching video, but... So there you go, um, and the thing that I love about that is it's so physical, and if you watch his body, in the, and, and it's really conveying what he's doing on the screen. Now, scratching video is actually sort of the obvious thing to do, um, but, and we haven't really had time to, to, to develop it any further yet, but you could scratch databases, websites, you know, it, it's just numbers, everything is a number at the end of the day. So. There's no reason why you can't scratch stuff like that. Um, if you have any questions, then uh, please feel free to fire away. Uh, but I'm done. Thank you very much. Anyone got any questions? Uh, sure. Uh, so it, it seems like a lot, of, a lot of playing. Yeah. Awesome. How, I guess my question is, how much of that flows into your formal for pay design projects? I mean, is it, is it very much in it, or is it more of a formal project? No, it, it's, it's, it's in various percentages, I would say. So if we're doing a site for, um, say, Kellogg's is, is one of our big clients, and who are fantastic. Um, but obviously, we can't go to them and say, we've got this vinyl thing and we're going to make a website. And so, but there's, there are learnings. Again, we sort of learn from the same experiences from so why the brown paper string thing. Or we can still leverage those type of things. Um, so it depends. Diesel, obviously, you can then go a stage further because the audience is, is more savvy with technology where Kellogg's is such a wide audience. You're trying to appeal to a, a bigger mass of people. Um, so, but play is, is at the centre of everything we do, and it's sort of that that ethos, that feeling of play, and, and just taking risks. And and I think these days, a lot of the time, in in some companies, you know, risk is not recognised, and the value of mistakes, you know, how accidents can come out of mistakes, and all that kind of stuff. So so we try and encourage that um, in every project, really. I don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> anyone else? Yeah. Uh, do you have a uh, strategy for capturing all your play in the environment so that it's more uh, retrievable and addressable to the team? Well, that's a really interesting question. And that that's something that we're, we are endeavouring to do. So like with the time lapse, um, if we're going to make something like that, we go, right, let's set up a, a quick time lapse thing. 
so we can document it. We take lots of photographs. We recently um, were working on projects at the moment where we're working with this incredible sound designer that, again, was just a random phone call. It turned out a super talented guy who lived in the same city. And um, he came in and recorded... Um, it's to do with pencils, what we're working with at the minute. And he recorded the sound of pencils, and he said, I'll come into your place and do it. So, because he, he knew the value of working with us like that. And we have um, a fourth floor, where we've got two floors, and on the fourth floor uh, of the building is uh, like a workshop area. And he came in, and set, we set up the cameras. and So we've got that documented now, and then when, we do that, when that project goes live, we'll make another little film. But I think there is a s much more we can do in that, cause I, and I think it really is important to document the process. And I'm a big Charles and Ray Eames fan, and they seem to always be able to document that stuff really, really well. I think it's because they were just taking so many photographs all the time, that's, that's how they did it. And it just becomes second nature. Um, but it is something I'm very, very interested in, if anyone has any ideas of how you can go about doing that. And th the danger is, of course, that you obviously don't want to show confidential stuff as well so we, we looked at you know should we have a webcam on the you know on the desks and stuff but of course you've got confidential information and and uh, one of the ideas for our website was being really up front and having like webcams and but not just like a webcam in the office that became somehow an interface to the to the site and the company but there's so many issues with doing that kind of stuff but it like i said it really is important to document the whole play process and also for people joining the company as well so then they understand the ethos of the company and you know so what what we did with that situation is it's a little bit like your uh photo viewer right yeah. you were doing earlier yeah and uh but the issue is we made a we wanted to do electronic version mm -hmm. of what you got with a cork board or with uh, these other persistent displays that yeah. you had all over with foam core or if you used that or cork board. Yeah. So we used projection uh, in the first place. And other times we used panels for projections. Mm -hmm. simpler. Because it was very important to have those things persistent there yeah. all the time. Right. And, and since much of what, because the transitions are so important, mm -hmm. the timing, and a lot of the stuff cinematic or interactive, yeah. we could not just have still images, but still images as thumbnails that would then let us come and access those, but they were always there all the time. Right. And that, that class of display is still really rare. Yeah. And the other part that's still missing in terms of tools, whether you're just working with video and or other media, is ways, what you always get with the DVD, you get the director's uh, yeah. commentary, yeah. the notion about not just with speech, but with markings and so on mm -hmm. to be able to annotate so you can turn that on or off when you have this reference material like why is it there so what's the backstory yeah, um, yeah. and that and that can for new people clients and so on and also with with the electronic version of course you can turn the confidential stuff off yeah yeah of course they yeah, come. Yeah. i think it's the whole that narrative thing you mentioned there it's, it's something we employ now in um pitch when, when we're actually pitching for new business and a lot of the times we show not just the end product but we show how we got there and, and we also show maybe iterations that didn't work. Um, and clients seem to really love that because they seem to be, like say, it's that whole director's cut thing and, and the director's, you know, special edition, listening to the commentary. And clients love that, you know, feel more part of the process. The, the other thing I was going to do is two other quick comments. On, on the play side, the, you know, there's this famous quote from Einstein that plays the most serious part of research. Yeah. And, and my take on that is these things are far too important take seriously um, and, and the and that there's a friend uh, Alex Manu who has a new book that just came out called play and it's M-A-N-U and if you want to check it out but but even if the result is for a serious piece of work the process of getting there I, I, I know you were well enough that play is behind everything it's, yes you're always doing multiple things that's where the ideas come from it's easy to forget though pardon it's easy to forget until you realize that something you've been doing at you know crazy hours of the night yeah. is actually awesome and you know mm -hmm. it was just some crazy stuff that had no goal whatsoever. Yeah. You, you know, parts that make, it builds up your personality and makes you find other solutions to very serious problems full of very in rooms full of serious people thinking yeah. about serious things. Yeah. But <laughs> but I want to come back to something that's the overarching theme and almost everything you said. You started off this <laughs> and, and what I 
I've noticed is that a lot of people doing interaction design, mm -hmm. and I mean, that, I mean that joke really seriously, is that the majority of people are taught what they think are storyboards right. are actually usually way too prematurely high fidelity screenshots right. of, yeah, yeah. As of state transitions through the, the interaction and with arrows. And of course, the whole experience is in the transitions, not the states. Yeah. And that if you look at that type of state storyboard, where in many cases you even leave the arrows off, you just have the states alone. Yeah. If the resolution of your early conceptual art on the transitions isn't as detailed or perhaps more detailed than the information in those representations on the states, you're clearly going to fail. Yeah. It's clearly wrong. And that the majority of people in the computer graphics side from the HCI and so on background have never seen a film storyboard. Right. They think that a bunch of screenshots is a storyboard when it's absolutely not. It's all about the arrows that show the motion within the frame and from frame, the interframe and the intraframe yeah. motion is the key part of a cinematic storyboard because yeah. that is the direction for the cinematographer yeah. and, and how it's to move. And, and we have none of that in the overall vocabulary. And so that wasn't the question. The question is, so do you have tools or techniques or pra practice how you might address that that you would prefer? Because I think that's, that's the article we should do together. Or you yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, do I have tools or techniques? I don't have any tools, but I think there's a room there to make tools because I think, like you say, when we do storyboards, it's, it's, it's like that. It's like screenshots and we're talking about the states rather than what happens in between. And, and sometimes it's like the stuff that I talk about when we need in our work, we need to employ even more because sometimes you just do the default and you get the work out the door. But these, these transitions, and it's weird you should mention transitions because I'm really, that is like my thing now. And, you know, to the point of like wanting to do talks about transitions and showing, um, I mentioned Shane, uh, the Western, and then I've got an example of three different Westerns showing de three different transitions. And it's all done with editing. And one of my big heroes is Walter Murch, who's Apocalypse Now and Godfather, etc. And he's a really interesting guy because he, he's almost a philosopher in some way. But he has this, he says, the problem with Hollywood as it is now is that it's very much like a black box in that the technology is so amazing that once you think of something, they can make it like that, exactly as you say you want it. Now, he doesn't like that process because he says what he prefers is what he calls a snowflake approach. It's like a snowflake, and as it drops to the ground, it picks up mistakes, ideas, things get added. And he says the problem is that now we're, we're, we're black box, we can, anything we think of we can make, but there's no room for these, these errors and these, which are transitions as well. So I'd love to explore what those tools could be because I, I, I think there is massive room for them. And I think within interactive design there's so much to learn from the craft of film and, and I think there's so many analogies with film because at the end of the day interactive design is a time-based, you know, um, medium. Um, so, and I've always, always been into film, so that's why it sort of influences a lot of the work. Um, but short answer is, I don't have any tools specifically, but I, I am always aware of the, what happens in between. I think it's the most important thing. Anyone else? Okay, should we leave it there? Thank you very much.